Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hello everyone, it is Carrie, and I am going to restart, because I think I did one episode of it, um, Flashback Fridays. So Catalyst has announced a lot of stuff coming out, um, and I wanted to talk about, at least in this case, um, a book that came out back in 1993 called Hot Spots. Now, essentially what this is, um, is a book that includes every, well, not every, but it includes a number of contracts um, for players and a game master to um, negotiate, essentially. Um, and I know that might sound interesting, but this was in a time before we had battle value, before we had even combat value um which came out in 1994 with the uh it wasn't maximum tech oh i can't remember it was the great book of cheese and i don't remember what it was called um i might be wrong it might have been in max tech but i think it was in tactical handbook um if i can find a digital copy we will take a look at that because it was a lot of so some of the concepts that we have currently in the game came from that and maximum tech um which were both very interesting books but let's go ahead and let's take a look at hot spots here so what this essentially is um you can see this poor dude trying not to Okay, so first of all, before I go any further, this picture does not make sense. Um, so, the Mad Cat, which I don't, you can't see my mouse, I don't think. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but the Mad Cat is shooting at the guy. Okay, that makes perfect sense. But the guy seems to be dangling towards the Mad Cat which i don't know how that would work anyway so it's still but it, it's bugging me now that i've looked at it for more than like a minute um so then we get into the book itself here and you start off of course with your table of contents and there is a introduction to the game or to not to the game but to the to the way this works and essentially it explains it here it has two books and i don't have the second book um i don't have it physically or digitally i need to find it um because the second book has all the contracts that the players get and as you're gonna see this gets a little crazy with the contracts um something else to note about this book is it does have a lot of artwork that is pre um unseen so you're going to see a lot of the unseen in here which is pretty awesome but you have two books one of them is full of contracts that are made to be able to be removed handed to the players this is the contract you're looking at taking the other one which is this one has the actual um what's happening so essentially you had a game master's book and you had a I don't know the, the word for it. You had another book that was just for the players. A player's book and a game of Aster's book. Um, the GM's book, we'll, we'll just use that term from now on. It's way easier to say for me. Uh, the GM's book has all the, the lowdown on everything. So as you see, you have all the stuff here. Um, it gives you the... Now, was you, this was a Battle Tech Compendium, Mech Warrior 2nd Edition, Battle Troops and Battle Space, or Battle Force. Um, and it also gives the map sets. 
if they don't want to create their own maps. Um, and some of them will have detailed maps and stuff like that. That was what was given to the players. It had those maps. It was, yeah, they're, without the second book, it's not as good. But with, like I said, with Catalyst wanting to make a second hot, uh, a new hot spots, because I know they made a Blakest hot spots, um, but it wasn't like this. It was more of, hey, here's what's going on in this place. Here's what's going, what's going on in this other place. Um, so, yeah. But, you know, we go down and then we get into, there's a beautiful picture of a Warhammer standing on something. I cannot identify that mech, but that, that or, yeah, it's a mech. No, it's a rifleman. Um, or it was a rifleman, because here's the antenna. Well, you can see the antenna in the bottom left. Um, and there's the gun arms off to the left. Yeah, so poor rifleman got stomped in by a warhammer, but he took his arm with him. It looks like a wasp is coming in behind for the kill. Um, so you have, like I said, you have the contract. And the contract's... You have the mission briefing, um, and you had to negotiate these. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, the, the unit negotiates the details of the contract based on the information provided. So the, the players playing as the unit, they would designate someone as their negotiator, or the head of the unit would just do it if the, if that's how they did it. And that person would negotiate the contract with the GM. Um, I think I've mentioned that a few times now, but so there's contract numbers, you have a Dragoons rating, and this is also, you know, this is back in FASA. Um, they played a little bit fast and loose with some of the stuff. Uh, Mercenaries handbook they referenced to tell you, hey, here's where you go to figure out the Dragoons rating. Um, and employer who's employing you location tells is basically your standard run of the mill. Hey, here's how stuff works. Um, but you do have a pay scale up here where depending on, uh, you use a mercenary's handbook to create a base pay. And then based on that, um, the GM makes an initial offer, and depending on what their, uh, you know, depending on what their pay rating is, I'm guessing this has is probably linked to the Dragoons rating. You lowball them if they're average or below, and then well, average you're getting ninety five percent, but you start lowballing them the other way. Um, just for the base pay on the contract. And then there's a negotiation modifier. Um, you don't roll anything, but there's like, here's what to do if players want something, you know, added to the contract. Um, support represents money the employer pays to cover their tech support and battle damage. So you have to kind of like guess at how much, how much damage am I gonna take during this campaign? And when I say campaign, I, you'll see when we get to them. Um, you also have to negotiate the salvage rights. Um, the situation is obviously what's going on. And then we get into the game master, the GM briefings. Um, and it gives you behind the scene op, uh, behind the scene information, the opposition to the, uh, to the players. That is everything from the size, the unit quality, the weight of the mechs. Um, aerospace elements, how much that weighs, armor, infantry, and the tech level. So you have everything. Um, and it's funny here because it says tech level indicates technology level to which opposing force has access. A tech level of 3025 means the opposition uses only standard pre-Star League technology. Um, that's a bit of a misnomer because obviously there's stuff that uses pre-Star League tech, as they want to call it, um, but was built before, uh, built after the Star League, but that's just modern mean that picking something that was 
that's a common sense meaning. Basically, just use stuff that is not Star League equipment. Uh, tech level 3050 means hey, they they have Star League stuff. 3055, they have new stuff using basically Star League stuff again, so it's really not a difference. And then clan tech is obviously clan technology. Um, an opposing force may not use any tech higher than the level listed. So then you have, of course, the offer, um, your different employers. You have the intersphere governments. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory. Um, five houses of the intersphere plus the free Roslog Republic and Comstar. Yeah, because this takes place in 3056. So Comstar would be a viable employer. Uh, then, of course, you have planetary governments. So somebody here isn't doing their job, you know, the inner, the, the, the inner sphere government. So one of the planetary governments just takes matters into their own hands and hires mercs. Then you have businesses, um, Starcore, Irene, uh, Irian, however you pronounce it. Um, you know, you're, you're. Luthien Armor Works, although they're pretty much state-supported, I doubt they would need to hire someone. Um, then, of course, your periphery realms, and it says other employers. Now, this is weird, but it's interesting. This this is one of the earliest instances where I see a reference to subcontracting mercenaries. Um, and it's it's interesting because... You know, even, it's even like special event organizers may hire mercenaries. Um, it, you know, so it's it's a different spin on, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, no, we're holding a giant thing. This person's going to be here. We need them to be protected and escorted and whatever. Um, and, of course, co your transportation, unit size, payment. Mission headaches. Um, so this is an interesting one. So a GM, if they want to make the mission even more interesting and or harder than than it already is, you have um, some problems that can happen. You have supplies that you know, so you get stuff late. You might run low on things. Um, the local population may not like you. They may just want you out. Um, then, of course, you have like your regular forces. And you have a, once again, a, you know, this is pretty common back then. Currency conversion table covers your C-bill. Um, it doesn't even cover the kroner. That, that's how bad it was. Now you also had your weather, your terrain. Um, oh, other mercenaries. This is something else I thought was interesting that they included. And I don't know, like, I haven't really seen this in any of the fiction. And it literally says, employers sometimes hire several mercenary units for the same mission. Um, duels between mercenaries may escalate into feuds and then de into debilitating loss of life. Unscrupulous mercenaries may even attempt to steal supplies from the other mercenary unit. So you could literally have people, like, stealing your, your crap. Um... You know, and of course, there's also the Finding Work, which talks about where is good to find work. Um, you, yeah, you can basically go to different hiring halls, stuff like that. Um, it talks about choosing the right mission, signing your contract. Um, and then you get Force Archetypes. So... This is where you start to get into some of the other stuff with the enemy units. Um, and this is pretty much where you're starting to get into the, you know, strictly... I mean, this book's pretty much the GM book, but you're getting into stuff that is more in-depth here. Um, so, first of all, there is a random damage table. Um... And it's kind of interesting because they needed to make it pretty easy to do on a 3D6. But at the same time, um, it, excuse me, 
it also is like oh yeah I, I guess you would have to do this yeah you'd have to do this on each unit that's involved um so you have everything all ammunition expended a d6 to every right side location um 20 points of damage in five point groups that's just normal hit locations ammo and one weapon is in half i guess you would just determine that randomly my heat sinks destroyed 25 percent or 25 points of damage an unusable weapon uh, extra heat on a weapon leg actuator damage two heat sinks destroyed an engine with a critical hit already uh, 10 points of damage to one location not the head five points of damage to all left side locations two points of damage to all locations no damage so yeah no matter what apparently you know that that's the other thing this book has sort of a feel of 3025 especially with this random damage table um but also also with uh yeah also with the the fact that like this is this is stuff you would have expected like in the periphery in this time period or 3025. Uh, then we get into force archetypes. Force archetypes, um, it gives you basically here's so and it's because of raiding parties. So it says here right here, raiding parties can be house troops making a lightning attack on another house, merc troops conducting a Retaliatory operation, pirates searching for salvageable component, sellable components, or any other type of operation that may be accomplished using specific, excuse me again, specific party size. And this is very, very detailed. Um, so like a light rating party, you have the Lance type. Um, and it's like just, it's one company of battle max. Okay, so this also gives you a good idea of the size of the player force that is expected to be here. Uh, light rating party is a company, company of battle mechs. They may have armor sport. They may have aerospace. They might. Oh, no, they will have infantry, at least a minimum of three platoons. Um, their tech level can be 3025 to 3055. Uh, anything from regular which i want to say would be a four or five to elite uh, at least back in that era i want to say four or five was a regular house troop and then of course mech vehicle quality um and gives you random damage then you have the medium rating party uh which is two companies of battle mechs and of course you can have all the same stuff and then the heavy rating party this is a full battalion of mechs with armor support, possibly with arrow support, possibly, and with a minimum of one company of infantry. Yeah, um, that should give you an idea of how large they expect the player force to be. You know. Then you have planetary garrisons. Uh, once again, small, which is a company and looks like they will always have armor and arrow and infantry support minimum oh god minimum of a battalion of infantry and armor is minimum of one company arrow is minimum of two lances of light fighters conventional um then you get the medium garrison they are two companies Once again, they will have fighters, tanks, and infantry. Minimum of a battalion of infantry. And you have the large, which is a full battalion, and they're going to have minimum of a company of armor support. That, that's, that's a lot. Um, aerospace support, they're going to have three lances. Infantry, they'll have minimum of two battalions. Um, and then of course, then you as the as the GM, then you have to go and generate all your lances, which it had 
Yeah, mind you, this is, like I said, this is before combat value. This is before um, battle value 1.0 or 2.0, which 2.0 is the one we're on right now. Um, this is before all of that. And, of course, as you can see, the light mechs, it's very predictable. It's a lot of wasps, stingers. Uh, Karita has panthers in there and herbies. Um, does everybody have an herbie? Uh, let's see. Oh, you get to pick out of the four that are in there, but that's that's kind of interesting. So, like, I'm checking to see if everybody has herbies back then. Oh, wow. Uh, the Steiner side of the Fedcom did not have urban max. Seeing as how they fought against Karita a lot, who built them, that seems weird. Free world and the Free Worlds League, who also has a plethora of urban max. Um, oh my goodness, that's that's fun. Thirty twenty five, thirty fifty. Leao has no urban max. Like that, that seems like a sin. Um, especially when the free the the free Roslog Republic and the Saint Ives Compact both have access to. In fact, the St. Ives Compact has the same level of access as House, um, as the Free Worlds League and the Draconis Combine. That That is messed up. And, I, you know, I know that Irby kind of became, um, like a little bit of a mascot. And then, of course, they just dropped the FR and, did they really do that? Yeah, totally dropped the FR and St. Ives. Uh, for the 3055 light mech table. Because um, they apparently are not allowed to have good things. They don't have Comstar in here. I guess they didn't think about Comstar being an employer. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of the unseen. There's hunchbacks all over the place. House, House Davian has like enforcers and centurions all in their media mechs in the 25 era and then of course you have your you know but yeah you see this all the way through and it's it's quite interesting i do like the fact they drop the free uh the they drop ross log and they drop st ives when they go to 55 as if they just don't exist um and your assault mechs and then let's see your tracked vehicles and this is not how specific this is just hey these are what is rolling around on the battlefield um hover vehicles then you get into the current political situation and it pretty much is like hey look uh you know the the clan invasion happened um there's a lot of work but you might get shot um by the clans because they're the clans and, and they like to shoot people yeah, I don't monetize anyway, so this isn't going to matter. Anyway, but yeah, no, the clans, you know, they, they do their thing. They 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 do clan stuff, and um, it talks about the Treaty of Taurus with... <sighs> yeah, this is... it back Even back then, in, in 56, you know, you had the Magistracy and the Concordat um starting to get chummy with um house layout and apparently according to this it was also the uh free worlds league and it talks about the blakists and the kind of trouble they're creating and of course here is everything that we knew at the time about the uh about the inner sphere and the close periphery, which, as you can see, is kind of interesting. So you have the Chanel, Chanel, Ch I'm pronouncing it wrong, Chanel Isles, um, which, if I recall correctly, that becomes the Scorpion uh, um, Imperio, the, 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 the Scorpion Empire. Oh, no, 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 that's Nueva Castile. That's different. Then you have the RimWorld's Republic Outpost, <clears throat> the Rim Collection, Cersinus. Uh, this is pre Illyrium Palatinate. Pa Palatinate. I can't pronounce that. Um, before that was sucked up by the Hegemony. Uh, of course, the Magistry, the Torns, NCR, Pirates over in Tor. 
that uh, uh, doesn't look spelled right. Outworlds Alliance. Then you have the Great Houses. Um, the little itty bitty Free Ross Log. And um, yeah, your clans the Nova Cats, Jags, Ghost Bears, Wolves, Falcons, and Vipers. Oh my. But yeah, you had all that. Um, so it gives you like a nice little map in the inner sphere. And then we get more political stuff. Uh, starts to talk about the Draconis, the Federated Commonwealth, um, <clears throat> and the threat that that poses to, you know, to the uh, Draconis Combine, the Free Worlds League, and to the the Capel Capellan Confederation. I just can't talk today. And then the Draconis Combine, um, and it also mentions the whole res rescinding the death to mercenaries order because of the clans. And how terrified they are, but mercenaries are sort of like, yeah, no, dude, you wanted to kill us. Like, you know, you, you said death to mercenaries and here, no, 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 we're not touching that. That That's, that's just, no. Um, then we get into the Free Worlds League, which is sort of like the same as far as, hey, you know, uh, Captain General's making us a lot of money by selling weapons. The Word of Blake's hanging out here a lot. It could be a problem at some point. And, um... Joshua is being treated for leukemia. A uh, little did they know what was going to happen soon. Um, then you have the Confederation and how Sun Tzu is sort of like hanging on by his, by, you know, by his political threads, as it were, as far as keeping the state from just falling apart. St. Ives, uh, the FedCom puppet state, which wasn't a puppet state, but definitely was a puppet state. The FRR, uh, the Comstar puppet state, because they essentially lost their sovereignty after Clan Wolf and Ghost Bear sucked them into the Clan War Machine. Um, and then, of course, you have the Periphery, where all sorts of things happen. Um, and then we get into the mission briefings. Okay, so first of all, before I go any further, I want to look at the art real quick. Um, these elemental helmets, so clans, when they came out, um, they were the boogeyman. They were the big, scary monster under the bed that was going to get you. Um, and if you'll notice, the artist here sort of did bring a little bit of that, that tried to bring a little bit of that um, cultural, that looks scary to me, into the elementals. Um, because if you look at a lot of, a lot of elemental battle armor, it doesn't, the helmets, the, the top part does not look quite like this. Um, these helmets look very, very inspired by the Stahlhelm, um, which was a German helmet from World War II, and I think World War One. although that, um, no, that was, was it the Picklehelm? I think World War One was the Picklehelm. World War Two was the Stahlhelm, um with that flared lower part it i mean it was an effective helmet but that point aside um the image of these elementals with the way their helmets are shaped and it's just like lines of them and they're just looking towards you is meant to evoke that kind of of um cultural that's not good that is a bad thing. I do think it's funny they have little running lights on the sides of the missiles. I'm sure those are supposed to be sensors or something, but still, they look like running lights. So let's take a look at a contract. So give me one second here. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab something to drink because my voice is getting a little a little crazy on me. Okay, so oh that might have come up pretty loud. I apologize. Anyway, so I kind of went through the contracts while I was having a drink. Take a look, see what we're looking at. Um, so some of these, like, like if we scroll up, I gotta get the right screen. There, if we scroll up, you have this contract, um, which is in the Capellan March, um, which is contract FC five six six zero seven dash zero zero one dash seven. So they they made this as immersive as they could. Uh, close hold firms, a Capellan based corporation, is attempting to take over uh, Alaska goods. They planted an agent in Alaska in order to stay abreast of upcoming transport runs. Using this information, the company hires troops or passes information 
the certain criminal elements of the Capellan Confederation and the Free Worlds League, and these forces either attack Alaski transports en route to their destination or attack the grounded ships and destroy their cargo. Close hold hopes to force Alaska into bankruptcy, purchase it, and so expands its holdings into the Davian side of the Fedcom. Alaska may have trouble paying its hired troops. Lost goods and customers have severely hurt the company's bottom line. Alaska offers full salvage rights, hoping that'll make up for low pay. An honest organization, Alaska will do its best to accommodate its hired troops. And then, of course, for more information, see contract. And this is kind of a Another reason they did this, CC 56607-001-7, page 58. Um, and of course, the opposition, Close Hold uses light raiding parties to attack the Alaska transports, but with at least two lances of aerospace. And of course, remember, a light raiding party is a company of mechs. Um, ground attack forces vary from mechs to the more common infantry and tank units. So let me go find CC 56607-001 dash seven and we will uh take a look at that contract all right so here we are cc five double six oh seven dash double zero one dash seven um and this is from the other end of it um so close hold, close hold does need units to protect its facilities but often it uses these same units to raid competitors close hold rarely uses trickery to obtain help preferring to buy the loyalty of crooked units Currently, Close Hold is out to destroy Alaska goods. It refers back to the other contract. Um, and of course, it talks about the deep cover agents and uh, attacking the Alaska transports. Um, Alaska has recently begun hiring mercenaries to protect their ships. So hired contractors, characters, will meet some resistance. Excuse me. Close Hold is also looking at High Point Traders as well, Free Worlds League contract. Hired characters will probably, probably be directed to infiltrate the Merrick firm, although Close Hold initially requests only simple information gathering. Eventually, it assigns the players assassination missions. Close Hold is a particularly devious employer that attempts to strand its hirelings when they have outgrown their usefulness or begun asking too many questions. Close Hold's favorite planet for this attack is for this is Atrokazi, Astrokazi, um, a periphery wasteland littered with destroyed cities and mechs. Opposition, light raiding party archetype with triple the number of aerospace fighters, no conventional support for defenders. Uh, when raiding a competitor's holding, characters may, be, may also encounter a po opposition ranging from infantry to battle mechs. Agents infiltrating high point traders face high point agents who are constantly watching for infiltrators. So, yeah, you have right here where it's like, you know, Alaska may be a good employer, but they're hard on they're they're hard on cash right now. Meanwhile, the Confederation's company, um, yeah, they, they'll they'll just strand you out in the periphery. Be like, yeah, no, go do this for us. And then they leave. They take all their jump ships, their drop ships, and they just go home and they leave you there to fight the roaming tribes. Um the, the nomadic tribes that, that live on that planet, because I can't remember what book it was, um, but there was one that covered that. And yeah, that that can get pretty interesting. Um, so going back up, though, give me a second. Let me go grab a DC contract for us. OK, so. We have contract DC 5660103-3. Um, now, behind the scenes. So, what this is from reading through it, what it looks like is a clan, uh, contract to attack clan forces. Uh, the Smoke Jaguars, in particular. This is where it gets interesting. Um, smoke, the Smoke Jaguars are tired and frustrated by the frequent combine raids and plan to strike back soon. So, it's, it's a raid. Uh, the player characters may soon find several stars of clan mechs bearing down their necks and themselves the only defenders on the planet. Um, okay, so this might actually be a garrison. Both worlds could prove... Oh, no. It's, it's an attack. Both worlds pr prove difficult to both attack and defend. However, the, cra the craters on 
oh, Chapinaria quickly become pit traps, killing the pilots of mechs too damaged to escape. The high winds of Metamoros consistently prove troublesome for missile fire or pilots of light mechs unsure of their footing. The player characters can take heart from the fact that most clan raiders will be free birth units grasping at an opportunity to prove themselves. Most of these units use second line mechs or inner sphere refits. Um, still means that there's going to be probably clan equipment in there. Both closer to the capability of standard inner sphere mechs. No. Uh, but the character's unit may still be outmatched. And mind you, when I say second line mechs, we're talking Warhammer 2C, Marauder 2C, Rifleman 2C. Um, this is this is before a lot of stuff had come out. Um, the Hellhound. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be floating around. Um, I want to say some of the C variants already existed. And it says here, opposition, the game master, the GM may attack with any force. Keep in mind that the clans will abide by their rules of engagement and bidding rituals, however angry they may be. So, the way clan rules of engagement work, because this is now very important, is that they, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows about the clan trials and one-on-one -on -one combat and all that, but let's say you are a inner sphere force, you are outmatched, and this clanner decides he's going to he's gonna challenge you. So, he starts fighting against somebody else, individually. That's, that's their MO, that's how, they, that's how they do things. And then... You decide, well, he's he's too much of a match for me. Um that 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 Warhammer 2C is is really just beating the crap out of my Warhammer, um, or my Marauder, or my Battlemaster. Um, so your buddies decide to shoot at him as well. Well, now you just started a melee. Um the clan the clan mechs at that point can just shoot at whoever they please and can group fire and <sighs> yeah. Um, it's a bad situation, especially because, once again, we don't have combat value. We don't have battle value. Um, combat value is not a great system. Battle value 1 was okay. It under-costed jumping mechs, I believe. Battle value 2 is pretty much where we've been at since... Oh, goodness. Um, it's It's been around a very long time at this point. But yeah, so... When you fight against the clans, there there is no, you know, you can't use double, you know, like say, okay, so like one method of ma of balancing was, all right, number of heat sinks. But if you're doing that, even if you do it at double rate, the clan mechs are going to have an advantage. So like, you know, how many heat sinks does the, does the player force have? Count the heat dissipation of the... Yeah, the player force, and then count the heat dissipation of the clan forces you're going to use. And, um, yeah, see how it matches up. They're going to be outgunned. Okay, let's do it by tonnage. Two tons of inner sphere for every ton of clan. They're going to be outgunned. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, this was impossible or nearly impossible to balance at the time. So, a lot of these, hey, we're going to go fight the clans missions, and you don't see a lot of them in here. Uh, most of them are like, go raid this company or defend this thing from another inner sphere power, thankfully, because um, this is post truce. So you're not just totally being outright invaded by, um, you know. But yeah, so it's it's one of those things where there, there's no scenario set up. You just sort of just do it. Um, also I'm going to go and, you know, so, I mean, pretty much the contracts it's at this point, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have the, the player gets a thing for, Hey, go raid these smoke Jaguar worlds. And then you, you know, you just kind of make up whatever you want for them. Um, but let's go, let's go scoot on down. I want to show you the contract that they have for this. Cause we've already been here for like 30 minutes. All right, so this is interesting. This is the mission contract. This is what, um, yeah, this is this is what the players and the GM would use to make the contract. And you have like the agreement executed between blank, hereafter designated employer, and blank, 
hereafter designated as unit provides employment for the unit military forces in the service of the employer. The employment is subject to the terms and conditions outlined below. You have the assignment, um, and it says what you know what the mission is defined as, and the unit will perform all operations within the framework of that mission, as well as general interests and needs of the employer. Uh, forces. How much? How much force is the unit providing? Um, if actual force is mustered at the time of this contract, goes into effect are seventy five percent or less than the originally estimated forces, or if they exceed the agreed upon strength by more than ten percent, unless excessive, unless excess troops serve for no more money than originally designated this contract. Um, so that's pretty much a, we can cancel this contract if you bring in more people or if you don't have the people you said you have. And um, yeah, length of service, how long the contract is, when it starts, when it ends, um, where the unit will be. Let's see. Uh, remuneration employer agrees to pay blank C bills per month to the unit. This money is be held with, by the MCRB subject to their standard fees of no more than 10% and paid to the unit according to the following schedule. Uh, the employer agrees to provide amount of blank C bills for the logistical support of the unit. Uh, the unit will reimburse the, the employer will reimburse the unit the amount of blank C bills if the unit provides its own supplies resupply of munitions and other specific battlefield material after each battle or campaign shall consist of blank percent over and above said salary requirements. So like I said, you have to sort of predict how badly am I going to get mauled in this scenario? Okay. Um, then we have transport. Um, how much, what percentage of the units being transported by the employer? Uh, salvage rights, you have to list out salvage rights here, and it, um, all equipment, vehicles, or other material recovered by the unit from enemy forces, <clears throat> depots, garrisons, industrial or civil centers, prisoners, and other sources shall be subject to the following claims of division. Uh, the command rights, so do you actually have command of what's going on, or are you under somebody? Um... Battlefield conduct. Unit agrees to battlefield contact conduct as set forth by the Ares Conventions. Any violations of said conventions are solely the responsibility of the unit and render this contract and further payments null and void. Um, so if you violate the Ares Conventions and your employer finds out, they, they can just they can just ship can you. Um, and they, they don't they don't have to pay you, they can just leave you there. Yeah. And then, of course, other terms. You can negotiate other terms. The signed at, the day, the year, the unit commander, the employer with the same thing. And then a witness. You know, I mean, it, it's it's crazy how much detail they went into with this. And, of course, you have, you know, that, that's about it, actually. Um, that is it. I mean, there's a few interesting things in here, like... Let's hop through real quick. Other little interesting points to note. There's this little piece of art. Um, I cannot identify this mech. The whole thing looks awkward to me. I don't know if that's supposed to be a behemoth. Um, that was a second liner floating around too back then. Uh, then you got a nice little one here, a vulture. Um, old school vulture right there with the spindly little arms because that was totally you know like who's that uh house layout mech warrior yeah i mean there's some interesting art in here you got <clears throat> that looks like a gen or two c and it's very very late 80s to mid 90s art in this book it was very nice but i kind of hope that you know here's a dude fighting a dragon no it's a spider fighting a dragon okay um that that's 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 interesting uh oh 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 okay so quick side note 
apparently there's a battle on Branth. Um, <clears throat> um so in so they they give you um let's see Branth Battletech and Mech Warrior game statistics are listed below. Uh or not on Branth. What's the I thought the world's name was Branth. Um but Branth are like little mini dragons. Well, not very many apparently. Um <clears throat> they have a walk of five, a run of seven. They can fly at a cruising MP of six. They do two points of damage to a mech on a punch or kick. And they can do one point with piloting skill roll roll piloting skill roll roll with a plus one modifier required to prevent uh, falling. I mean kicking already causes you to try that or to do that, I think, but I don't think there's a plus one, but still, that's that's insane. Um you can have a mech fight dragons. There there's rules for it. It's right here. Um and I'm sure there's stuff because Yeah, toxic spit. Um, that is crazy. Oh my goodness. Brimps may make up to two physical attacks per round. This may consist of two punches or a punch and a tail lash. Yeah, that's 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 crazy. So, yeah, I mean, that's hot spots. And what I'm really hoping for is that when Catalyst puts out their new hot spots, it's more like this, where it's like a two person thing where you have contracts, you have some explanation for the players of where they're going, what they're doing, you know, and then you have the GM side where it's just like, hey, here's what you're getting into or what your players are getting into. Here's how to set it all up. Give me a second. I got a drink again. Here's how to set it all up. Here's how to do everything. And just, yeah, you know, um, I'm, re I'm really hoping for something like this, where it's, it's, it's a very player GM interactive thing. And yeah, um, helps to give some more immersion, gets a little bit of the role playing system in there kind of binds it all together so that is everything for hot spots um i'm gonna see if i can find a digital copy of the other one i talked about um tech manual um hopefully i can it was it was an interesting book but yeah so that is it um, I know that you and I have wasted f almost 50 minutes of time. Um, if you enjoyed this, if you, if you want to see more content like this, um, I would highly recommend that you go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash unicorn company. And, um, you know, the, the more that we're able to build that up, the more stuff we're going to be able to cover and the, the more that we'll be able to uh, do and get improvements to our equipment. Um, so, yeah. And um, also, I want to recommend my sponsor, Fortress Miniatures and Games. Uh, they are a wonderful sponsor. Um, they really, you know, they they really work for the community. And because um, they host a tournament every year, um, which is gigantic it's over it's going to be over 100 players this year they um they have great stuff on their website they they do have individual miniatures some um it depends on like what what they get in and all that but they do have individual plastics they also have iron wind metal iron wind metal metal miniatures yeah, say that five times fast. Um, but pretty much it covers like the, you know, like like everything that has been built. But also they're getting some of the new classics out there. We're actually going to be taking a look at the Warhammer next. Uh, we'll be taking a look at the Warhammer tomorrow. Um, and of course, 
Next week is the Urban Mech Force Pack, which uh, they so graciously provided us. So, yeah, check them out. They're a wonderful, wonderful online store. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just want to thank, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, great evening, great whatever it is where you are. This is Carrie signing off. I'm gonna find my meaning, I can make a change I wanna play the game You wanna sit